an opportune time to um, remind staff whether or not the, the rule of six applies to their work or role. And also just to, to kind of, again, reiterate all the measures, the health and safety kind of steps that you've taken to ensure your staff's well-being and safety in the workplace. I think there might also be a, it might also be a good opportunity to have a board level discussion or at least consideration of what you intend to do in terms of managing staff well-being, getting staff back into the office, and also perhaps business development. I think since we got the kind of green light or maybe maybe amber is a bit more appropriate um, at the start of August um, to start coming back into the workplace, I think a lot of us have been trying to get back to normal practices. And certainly I know that we've obviously been trying to plan to, to finally see each other in the flesh after so many months um, for kind of social purposes. And then there's also a real kind of, a, kind of excitement to go out, back out and meet clients and things like that. And I think although those certainly things that are work-related or training-related wouldn't be prohibited under the new rule of six. I think there is definitely cause for concern and it's perhaps worthwhile us persisting with the, the kind of virtual approach to um, socialising and to business development just for a little while longer. So definitely worthwhile bearing that in mind. On to furlough. Um, we are rapidly approaching the end of the scheme, um, which I think will be good for some, not so good for others. Um, at the moment, the, the next change that we're going to be seeing is on the 1st of October. And um, so as of the 1st of October, the government will again reduce their contribution to um, furlough pay. That will be dropping down to 60% of wages and the cap will be dropping to £1,875. Now, employers will still be required to top up employees' pay for those furloughed hours to pro rata 80% of their wages at the cap of 2,500 gross. You'll also have to pay all pension contributions, tax and national insurance contributions for all of the pay. That includes the contribution from the government. Now, although there have been some calls over the last week or so from MPs to extend the job retention scheme for certain categories of workers, I haven't seen anything concrete to suggest that there are any plans in place. At the moment, that's just mutterings. Um, then again, as we've seen throughout the whole COVID experience, doesn't mean anything, everything can change. Um, so, you know, um, keep your eyes peeled. There may well be a change at 11.59 on the 31st of October, which I'm sure we'll all be delighted about. Um, other thing to mention is the government bonus, the £1,000 that the government is offering to pay for each furloughed worker that you bring back after the end of the job retention scheme and you retain until at least the 31st of January next year. Um, they need to remain in your employment by the end of January next year. And they need to have earned on average £520 per month for the months of November, December and January in order for you to be eligible to claim that grant. Now, £1,000 isn't going to be enough for you to um, keep staff on that would otherwise be made redundant. If you are going to keep on staff that do meet those eligibility criteria, make sure you access that grant. That's money that is available to you. Um, the last thing to probably mention about furlough is the clawback. Um, and I think we've obviously had lots of discussions on these webinars about the clawback over the months. Um, there's some more clear guidance on this now. And the HMRC have notified us that they will be um, spending more time looking into um, claims and there will be powers that are given to them now to pursue any fraudulent claims or dishonest claims. Now, if you've overclaimed, you have to notify HMRC within 90 days of the date that you receive the grant that you are not entitled to, or within 90 days of the change of your circumstances, which mean you are no longer entitled to that grant. If you don't comply with those rules, then you might well face prosecution and you could be looking at a penalty. And the penalty can be up to 100% of the money that you've claimed and are not entitled to. So you could be looking at quite a hefty financial payout there. Um, they have spoken publicly at HMRC and they've said that they're now looking at 27,000 high risk cases where they believe that serious errors have been made in calculating payments. Now, they think those errors have cost them up to 3.5 billion with an estimated 5 to 10% of furlough money has been awarded um, incorrectly. Now, I think kind of thinking kind of that through, I think press are probably going to start to, to look into that. And I think they would probably have a field day with any kind of large name brands that fall foul of those rules. And I think there's definitely a risk of reputational damage there, um, especially if there's any sort of negative press around it. So I think my advice to you in terms of the callback would be 
take this time now to go back through the claims that you've made, make sure they're all accurate. If there are any discrepancies, address them sooner rather than later. Um, I think you're more likely to get a kind of a lenient response from HMRC if you take action into your own hands um, rather than waiting for them to come knocking on your door. Okay, so that's the, the furlough staff over and done with. Good stuff. Um, Self-isolation and quarantine issues. So kind of looking at more of the, the nuanced questions that we received. And one of the questions we received was, if a member of staff has to self-isolate for seven days and then tests positive for COVID-19, meaning that they have to be off for 14 days in total, can you insist that they get a fit to work note um, as they're obviously only able to self-certify for seven days? The simple answer to that is yes, you can get, ask them to provide you with a note to confirm that they've tested positive for COVID and therefore have to self-isolate. Um, it's actually not a GP fit note, however, it's an isolation note. Um, I understand because of the of GP practices have been inundated, the rules on this have changed slightly. So it's an isolation note that you'd be looking to get. Your employee can get these quite easily, either by calling NHS 111 or by making an on -clay, online claim to NHS. Um, and they'll be able to provide them with kind of email confirmation that they have to self-isolate. You can then use that for any future SSP payments um, that you need to kind of make. And you need to, if you need to make a rebate claim under the SSP rebate scheme. Um, kind of thinking about kind of traveling and self-isolation a bit more generally, um, obviously the list of exempt countries seems to be changing on a near daily basis. Um, and we're now looking at most of the Greek islands are now um, off the safe list, as is Portugal. I mean, we've got very few places to go now. Um, so the government have, have advised, obviously, coming back from these non-exempt countries, you will have to self-isolate for 14 days. The government have also now clarified that you may have to self-isolate for 14 days where you have to transit through these countries. Now, that is in cases where you have to stop and potentially new travellers come onto the plane, or if you yourself have to get off the plane, kind of mix with people kind of on the ground and then get back on the plane, you too would then be required to self-isolate. Now, of course, the difficulty is going to be policing that. In order to do that safely, you really do need to have um, good processes in place and, and require your staff to inform you of their travel plans ahead of time and whether or not they will have to travel to a non-exempt country or in fact transit through any of these countries. It may be possible for you to refuse to authorise holidays where employees are planning to travel not to non-exempt countries. You could also revoke any pre-authorised leave where employees are intended to travel to a non-exempt country. However, make sure that you're very careful about that because you will need to demonstrate that you have a genuine business reason for doing so. Otherwise, there's a potential risk of uh, um, a breach of trust and confidence and in extreme circumstances, potentially a claim for a constructive dismissal. Now, if you know ahead of time that your employee is going to have to quarantine when they return from their holidays, have that discussion ahead of time, of course. Work out how you're going to manage that. Are they going to take annual leave? Are they going to take unpaid leave? Or can they just come back and work from home without any issue? Um, things are obviously a little bit kind of more difficult in terms of people that travel away and the rules change whilst they're away. That's not so fun. Um, or for employees that book non-refundable travel um, to a safe country that is then removed from the safe list. I think, I think we've spoken about this before, but I think we understand that the employment tribunal's approach to these sorts of claims are likely to be sympathetic. And I therefore advocate a similarly sympathetic approach from the employers. I think conversations with your staff, trying to find a workaround there um, is probably going to be your best bet. Of course, bear in mind that you don't have to pay staff um, when they are not undertaking work, but hopefully you'll be able to find a solution that is beneficial to both you and the employee. So moving on to the next question, um, where is an employee's normal place of work? Um, the question was, how do we sustain home working but maintain the office as the normal place of work where people can still be expected to attend on requests and avoid associated quirks like mileage claims for attending work. It's a really valid question because obviously we kind of started this back in March with no understanding of how long it would go on for. And truth be told, we're not really sure anymore how long we're going to be here working from home. Um, I think the, the simple answer here is contracts should continue to reflect 
that the office remains the normal place of work. But you need to ensure that you have a flexibility clause within that contract, which allows you um, to require staff to work from home, either on an ad hoc basis or as agreed with their manager. So it might be that you do need to vary the contract slightly to include such a clause. I think Bethan's going to touch on variation of contracts in a little bit. Um, I think the one thing to say is, if that's the case, then travelling into the office would mean more normal commuting. There'd be no requirement to pay any expenses for that. And certainly that's kind of backed up by current case law. And things become slightly muddier in terms of, um, kind of especially tax. And bear in mind, I am not a tax lawyer, um, that if members of staff are going to be working from home for a prolonged period, say 24 months or so, then there are additional tax complications there. So I think if this is only going to be for a year, up to maximum of 24 months, we can get away with continuing to have the office as their normal place of work. If it's likely to last longer than the 24 months, then I think we need to have a further consideration as to what we should be putting in those contracts. And I think that's probably the time that you pick up the phone to perhaps Bethan or myself or even Andrew, and um, we'll talk you through um, the appropriate process. Next question. Um, occupational health assessments during COVID, can employers insist an employee attend an occupational health assessment if they consider there's a need? This could be for an employee continuing to work at home or one who is reluctant to return to the office. Um, in general, um, to answer that question, employees um, do have the right to refuse to attend an occupational health assessment. In such circumstances, um, the, the best approach is obviously to have a conversation with the employee and to ascertain why they don't want to attend that um, appointment and see if there's a way that you can encourage them to do so. In fact, many occupational health providers now carry out assessments remotely, um, either over the phone or by video call. So it might be that you could consider that as an option, and that might well alleviate any employee's concerns about attending an appointment in person. Um, occupational health would then be able to provide recommendations on whether or not the employee is able to return to the office and what the employer might put in place to ease that transition. If the employee continues to refuse, of course, then it may be that we need to be looking at disciplinary or capability procedures. Um, but I think there are certain steps we probably take before we get there. That can be quite an, an aggressive approach. Um, and I think in those circumstances, you would be best placed to have a conversation with us about the specific facts of the matter and what steps have been taken before we um, initiate any sort of disciplinary procedure. Um, one of my favourite questions, and this is my last question, um, was can an employer enforce their drug and alcohol testing policy and procedure with staff who are working from home? I did see an article recently that suggested that sales of wine have gone through the roof in the last kind of six months. I think mainly um, from parents that have been forced to homeschool. Um, and so there has certainly been some concerns about staff um, enjoying an extra tipple or two. Um, to answer the question, yes, you can enforce that policy at home, but obviously there's going to be practical challenges in doing so. Um, I think the first things first is you need to have a clear drug, alcohol, substance misuse policy in place, and that needs to be drafted in such a way that it would cover home working. Um, normally, they are drafted to cover um, kind of MD on work premises or MD undertaking um, work on behalf of the company. And these normally state that such um, sorry, kind of consumption of alcohol or use of drugs and whilst on company property or whilst undertaking work for the company would not be tolerated, and there would be scope for testing if they think the policy is being breached. Now, if the policy is drafted in that sort of manner, then yes, it would apply to home working. Now, for the vast majority of businesses, the awareness of such a policy and, of course, kind of common sense and social norms um, should hopefully be enough to avoid you having to investigate employees' use of substances whilst they're at um, home. Um, so I therefore recommend that you double check that your policy is appropriately drafted to cover home working and then ensure that that is accessible by all your staff. And you might also want to issue it to all of your staff again, just to remind them that that policy remains in effect whilst they're working from home. Now, if you get a member of staff that admits um, that they are um, misusing alcohol or drugs whilst they're working from home, I think the first step you need to do is you need to do a bit of investigation just to work out that that's not linked to a medical condition that might be a disability. 
Um, of course, alcohol and drug dependence aren't disabilities in and of themselves. So perhaps a little bit of investigation around that and the potential for an occupational health um, referral um, there. Um, if there is no kind of medical condition that we need to be concerned about, disability of such, then of course we could look at disciplinary procedures to address the issue. If the water has become somewhat muddied when you've got members of staff that you think are probably utilising drugs or alcohol whilst working at home, but don't admit to it, which I'm sure would probably be the, the vast majority of cases, um, I think there, there is certainly scope to drug test at home. Um, I think in the current circumstances, I think many um, drug testing companies are going to find it difficult to fulfil their regular commitment to testing your staff while staff are working from home. Um, I think there's one way to overcome that is potentially to look at self-testing and you can now buy reliable drug tests um, online that people will be able to use. So there might well be scope for you to implement mandatory testing um, among staff. I think that's really only going to be justifiable for um, kind of roles that are safety and perhaps business critical. Um, but that's certainly something that you could look to do. It's quite an extreme approach. Um, and you think you'd really have to consider your rationale quite um, thoroughly um, before you implement that. Without such a drug testing um, process in place, there might be scope to nonetheless push forward with disciplinary procedures. But again, it's one of those questions where we probably need to speak about the exact facts of the matter before we decide on what would be the most appropriate strategy. So I guess to, to summarise, check your policies up to date and contains the right wording. Reissue it to all the staff and have a think about whether drug testing might be appropriate in the circumstances. Um, and that is all of the questions that I had, Bethan. I think, Bethan, you got quite a few questions about um, variation of contract, and you're going to step in to field those for us. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Lindsay. Um, yes, I'm going to be looking at um, a few questions that we've had in, kind of neatly fall within two key themes. Um, so contract um, variations, contractual changes, um, and, and other issues around contracts, um, and then also redundancy and specifically monetary redundancy. So the first question, um, straightforward question, what is the process required to ask staff to reduce their contracted hours for a period of time? And this is obviously something that many employers are thinking about at the moment, trying to plan for the end of the furlough scheme and how that's going to impact on business um, for the foreseeable future. And it might be that if you can kind of see a um, maintained drop in um, work levels, then you want to be considering um, other options such as um, part-time working for a period of time. Um, it's also worth bearing in mind, of course, that it is open to you to agree your own period of furlough. So just because the government aren't paying for it going forward, there's nothing to stop you from um, agreeing with a member, excuse me, with a member of staff that they would carry on on furlough for, for a longer period of time, um, which essentially just means that you have the benefit of um, the reduced salary costs for, for whatever period you agree. But with any of these changes, it's essentially a process of consultation. So um, meeting with your staff, I think I would write to them to start with setting out whatever your proposal is and the rationale, um, and then meeting with them to discuss it, answering any questions that they might have, and then hopefully agreeing that change with them. Um, in the current climate, I think employees are probably more um, open to agreeing these kind of changes. Um, and I think as an employer, your kind of trump negotiating card is obviously what you're trying to do is avoid redundancies. So on that basis, staff are more likely to agree a period of um, reduced um, salary or, or um, lower hours um, simply to, to try and kind of save their jobs for the foreseeable future, particularly if you can see that things will pick up um, maybe earlier in the new year, something like that. So basic processes, consultation, trying to agree it with staff. Um, just on that, you ideally you would always get express agreement. Um, to be able to change contractual terms. There are a couple of other methods which I don't think um, are likely to be appropriate in these kind of cases. So it is possible to unilaterally impose a contractual change on the member of staff. 
Um, and similarly, you could terminate their current contract and offer re-engagement on new terms. Um, both fairly kind of nuclear options. Um, there are risks involved, constructive dismissal, breach of contract, that sort of thing. Um, it, they can be useful to um, make use of those methods depending on the circumstances. But with this sort of thing about, for example, asking someone to um, reduce their hours, it's not going to be possible to impose that unilaterally because obviously you need the employees buy-in in order to get them to work with reduced hours. You can't impose that on them. So in this particular um, case, I think we should be aiming for express agreement and negotiation with staff. Um, and hopefully in the circumstances, you might find that um, staff are more likely to agree to that. If you know that this is going to be a temporary change, then again, spell that out, make that absolutely clear to staff so that they are then more likely, I think, to agree to it if they can see that there's an end date in sight. Um, it, this does feed into the next question that we've had, which is fairly similar. Um, again, looking at planning for the end of the furlough scheme, um, wondering about how to ensure that an employer's position is not compromised. If you request staff to carry out part-time work now, but in time, it turns out that actually part-time work is something that you want to impose kind of indefinitely. So is there any way of, of protecting an employer's position now um, to ensure that they are able in future then, you know, in six months' time, when you had been planning originally to reinstate someone to full hours, if actually you think about saying we just don't need that person to come back full time, we could we could ask them to work part time for a um, kind of on, on a permanent basis. So again, similar sort of process in terms of the consultation with them to reduce hours in the first place. I think I would make it absolutely clear that this is a temporary change because at the moment you are anticipating it still would be temporary. Um, but it's probably worth explaining that you will then review it at the end of whatever temporary period you manage to agree so that you leave open that there's no guarantee of a return to full hours um although you might also not want to um spell that out that you're thinking that you might never need them to return to full hours because they're less likely to agree to it now um but it's something that you can then review and the issue really is around redundancies um if you can agree with a member of staff to reduce their hours on a permanent basis then great again it's simply a matter then of issuing them with a new contract or a contract variation method to affect that change if they don't agree to it there is a chance that they would be able to say the reduction in my hours is sufficient that my role is actually redundant um and there has been case law on this you don't need to have a reduction in headcount for there to be a redundancy situation. And the courts have said that actually, if you're trying to reduce someone's hours by a certain amount, they didn't give any kind of um, clear um, kind of guidance as to exactly what that amount would be. But um, I think anything above 20% definitely would be falling within that likely to be a redundancy. Um, and arguably it could be more than that, depending on the hours that someone's working already. Um, but it's just worth bearing in mind that actually if you try to impose a permanent reduction to part-time working, you could actually end up with a redundancy situation. If the member of staff isn't happy to agree to that change, they could be demanding a redundancy payment. So coming back to that question, I don't think there's anything that you need to do immediately to protect the position other than making it clear that the reduction to part-time working is a temporary change and will be reviewed um, at the end of that, that, that period of time. Um, but certainly if at that point you also then think we, not, we no longer need this role to be part-time, it could be a redundancy situation that you need to be, um, that you need to be following through with. That, I suppose, brings me on to redundancies, which is the next thing that I was going to be talking about. Um, we've had a specific question about voluntary redundancy. And um, if, you make a voluntary redundancy so someone asks for the R and you accept that request but you then have to backfill the position is that still a legal redundancy or could the person claim unfair dismissal um there's a couple of points here i think if you need to backfill the position um query whether it was a redundancy situation at all anyway um that seems to slightly undermine the um need to make a redundancy 
However, I can see that there might be circumstances where you would um, announce a kind of genuine restructuring, um, genuine redundancies, and then perhaps you end up with more voluntary redundancy applications than you were expecting. Um, and a change in the workforce in other areas might mean you want to be back filling a position. So I can see that that might happen. Um, the point is, I think, without any voluntary redundancy, it's always worth bearing in mind you probably won't have gone through a fair process in order to make that voluntary redundancy. So you won't have completed your, your redundancy consultation prior to agreeing with the voluntary redundancy. Um, and so there's, it's always worth considering whether a settlement agreement is um, beneficial in voluntary redundancy situations, um, because although someone has agreed to it, there is always scope for them to change their minds, decide that the process you have followed haven't been fair, um, and wanting to kind of try and backtrack on that. I think in practice, often it's low risk, because actually if someone has come to you asking for voluntary redundancy, then the chances of them subsequently deciding to bring a claim seems um, seems fairly unlikely. The chances seem fairly low. Um, but you'll want to be making that decision based on the circumstances, based on the nature of the employee, you know, the certain, and, and the individual that you're dealing with, as to whether a settlement agreement might be a better way of dealing with it. Um, so in answer to that specific question, it may well have been a reasonable redundancy, but there is still chance that anyone could bring a claim um, following a voluntary redundancy, particularly if you shortcut the process, which inevitably you have because people ask for it, the redundancy halfway through a consultation process and you haven't completed it. So, um, yes, there is a risk there, but possibly no risk. Um, again, a related question um, in terms of um, redundancies. A question about how soon after making the redundancy can you start recruitment in other departments of the business? Um, the answer to that question, it depends. When you're talking about other departments of the business, um, there's nothing to stop you making redundancies in one part of your business and not the other. So you might still have a need for um, the same number of roles and indeed additional roles so that you're recruiting in one area even when you're making redundancies in the other. Um, so on that basis, the answer would be, well, there's, there's no need to delay at all. You could start recruiting straight away. A um, couple of things on that. It's just worth bearing in mind that as part of the redundancy process, you should be offering alternative vacancies. Um, and so if you've got vacancies in other areas of the business, query whether those should be offered as part of um, the consultation process. Um, failing to offer um, alternative vacancies could mean that the redundancy is unfair. Um, but on the basis that um, it's a completely different role, um, the person you're making redundant hasn't got the skills, wouldn't be able to retrain, for example, then there's no reason why you shouldn't recruit straight away. Um, in terms of, you know, to be absolutely safe, you would normally wait for the three months, which is the time period within which someone could bring a tribunal claim. So once that three month deadline's passed, you know you're not going to face a claim and then it's safer. Um, but I think it, it sounds as though in that situation, if you're looking at other departments, um, then there may well not be um, any need to, to, to um, delay and you could start recruiting straight away. Um, and then finally, um, Again, another contractual question, slightly different one this time, about restrictive covenants um, and about the reasonableness of a restrictive covenant and um, the terms that you can include within a settlement agreement. Um, so the first thing to say is just uh, um, the uh, sort of basic about a restrictive covenant is that it should always be drafted as narrowly as possible. Um, the default position is that they'll always be unenforceable. Um, unless they go no further than absolutely necessary to protect the employee's business. So that's the first thing to say. So the example that's been given is, would it be reasonable to say they can't work for a competing business within 20 miles for a period of six months? Um, yes, that, that might well be reasonable. Um, it will depend on the nature of the role, the seniority of the person involved, um, whether six months is um, absolutely necessary, could you get away with three? It just depends a little bit on the um, individual circumstances in terms of um, reasonableness. It is also just worth bearing in mind that there is an argument, you talked there about um, 
including restrictive covenants in a settlement agreement. Um, there is an argument that employees might say, well, if you didn't need the restrictive covenant at the outset of employment, why do you need it now? So why would you be bringing it in at the end of the employment relationship? And, and is that reasonable? So contractually, there's nothing to stop you from doing that. Um, you need to be careful to ensure that you're given consideration for that restrictive covenant to make sure that there is some kind of um, benefit to the employee in signing up to it, to, again, to ensure that that covenant is enforceable. Um, but it's also just worth um, preempting that argument that a covenant um, entered into at the end of an employment relationship is less likely to be um, enforceable because of the fact that you, you should be looking at trying to protect your business. And if you didn't need it at the outset, why do you need it now? So it may well be that there's things that have changed through through employment, that um, the roles change, the seniority's change, um, you've invested more in that individual, for example. So there might may well be reasons why you want you would want to include it. But it's just worth having those reasons to hand so you are able to justify that and also making sure that you do provide proper consideration for the covenant to ensure that it's enforceable. Um, this is often why you'll end up seeing part of the termination payment is carved out specifically um, as consideration for the covenant. Um, but again, just um, summarising that really, but the example given of um, non-compete within 20 miles for six months, that could well be enforceable, but it just needs to be reasonable in the circumstances, taking into account the individual circumstances um, of the case. So I think that's all I was going to cover. I'm going to hand over to Andrew just to finish off with a little round up of something that, I mean, we haven't spoken about this for ages. I feel like we weren't talking about anything else prior to Fair, but just to go back to Brexit, everyone's favourite um, other, other hot topic. So I'll hand over to Andrew to cover that off. Lovely. Okay. Well, thanks, B. That's that's great. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, nice to be here this morning. It's a special day today because it happens to be my birthday. So what better to uh, be doing a webinar presentation on your birthday? Um, Can now, you I've been to given, you, Andrew. Well, there we are. I've I'll now been given. Yeah, I've been given seven minutes. It seems to try and unravel the hideously thorny issue of. Uh, Essentially, what's going to happen to employment law after we leave? Uh, well, after the end of uh, we have left, of course, at the end of the transition period, and what is going to be uh, the effect uh, of the end of the transition period upon uh, EU jurisdiction and the jurisdiction of the European Court? Um, and this is a subject that's sort of slightly become masked by COVID and everything that's gone on, and. We'll have seen now, this has now come back uh, with a vengeance. Um, we've now got the internal market bill that the government is wrestling with, and we're in the final throes, possibly, of either agreeing a deal or not agreeing a deal on the political declaration. We just don't know. And a deal around employment rights is going to be a key issue in that ongoing, highly charged political struggle. So, in short, in the answer to this question, there are things we know, and there are still a lot of things we don't know. So let's just first of all just deal with the easier part of what we know is going to happen. Um, now, under the EU Withdrawal Act, which is in law, that makes clear that as of 31st of December 2020, when the transition period ends, all existing EU law will be enshrined into UK law. That is a clear agreed fact, so we know where we stand on that. So as at that magic date, 11 p.m., 31st of December 2020, whether you like it or not, the transition period is going to end and we will effect formally leave, although we have, of course, actually left. And at that day, all existing EU law that we're currently having to comply with becomes automatically enshrined into UK law. So it's frozen in aspect, a clear cutoff. So that, that is clear where we are as at that moment in time. What happens after the 31st of December when the bright new dawn of the 1st of January comes, 2021, is much less clear. And um, let's first of all just deal with it. One of the questions asked, what happens about European court jurisdiction? Well, after the 1st of January 2021, 
the European Court of Justice ceases to have supreme jurisdiction over our laws. Finish. End of. Uh, our Supreme Court becomes our supreme arbiter of laws and Parliament becomes our supreme lawmaker. So the ECJ's jurisdiction over our law disappears, but it still remains in a sort of ghost-like form because, uh, because of all the EU cases that have, will have been enshrined into UK law at the end of the transition period under the Withdrawal Act. Those cases will become enshrined in British law and UK courts will still have to look to the decisions of the European Court of Justice in deciding on the effects of those cases. So British, you'll be in the position where, although British courts essentially will not be bound by, well, they certainly won't be bound by new ECJ decisions, the, the, uh, the spectre of the ECJ will still continue to hover over the judiciary in that it will still influence UK court decisions in respect of EU decisions that are still in place. Um, so that's really the best description I can give at the moment of how it will work in terms of ECJ jurisdiction. As to the big million dollar question of what changes will there be made to UK employment law after 1st of January 2021, well, that depends on one of the deal that the government eventually reaches or not with the EU in the next month, because the question of workers' rights is one of the really hot topics that still remains to be dealt with, along with state aid and fisheries policy. And these balls are being, as you all know from the nightly news, being batted furiously about at the moment, and we don't know where they're going to land. But from what the government has said to date is that it has no intention to materially roll back from existing EU uh, legal protections uh, and certainly not to roll back and dilute existing workers' rights that obviously enshrine massive amounts of EU law. So if the government says as it's said to date, I think it's unlikely that there's going to be a material rollback in terms of existing EU-derived rights, where we're looking at things such as discrimination rights. Uh, I'll come on to work in time in a minute. I can see the talk is, tick is it's ticking along, but I'll hurry up. Um, discrimination rights, that is not all going to be unbundled. That is completely embedded in our law. And it would be politically very damaging for a government to be seen to be doing that. So I can't see there's going to be a major rollback on, dis on embedded discrimination rights. Um, but what might change? Well, a certain number of areas have been sort of flagged that could, I think, be subject to change. First of all is rights coming from the Working Time Directive, the Working Time Regulations, which is our uh, legal importation of that. I think there will be some change around the working time regulations, but there'll be some tinkering. We're not going to have a complete uh, withdrawal of the working time regulations, which affect things such as paid holiday um, and working hours, rest breaks. I don't think that's going to materially change, but there could be some tinkering. And I think the areas they could look at would be, um, they might look at the, the actual 48 hour limit on the working week. There might be some tweaks to that, certainly amongst some special exemptions. There might be greater uh, exemptions coming in on that. Um, I think we will see the probable end to the right to accrue holiday whilst you're off sick, which is a derived right under the working time regulations. Um, I think that'd be welcomed by many employers. I think there'll also be some amendments to the highly complicated rights to enhanced holiday pay that relate to overtime and bonus and commission entitlements. That has become a huge issue over the last 18 months. Much of this derived from EU law, and I think there will be some regulation on that to probably pair back holiday pay to basic pay. Um, because this has been a real issue for many employers who operate overtime arrangements, shift arrangements, bonus arrangements, all of which now have to be potentially calculated in your holiday pay. Um, 
There could be some tweaking with 2P, but I don't see there's going to be a, any major rollback of 2P. Uh, it's embedded in our law. That's how outsourcing operates. That's how people buy and sell businesses. I just don't see that's going to be materially changed. But the area where there may be change is around the tricky area of harmonizing terms after a 2P transfer. Many of you will have been involved in businesses where you may have acquired businesses under 2P. The first thing you want to do is to put all the acquired employees under your new super uh, extra mean harmonized terms. Now, you know, that that doesn't work under cheaper. You cannot do that. And that's been a real practical stumbling block for, for many acquirers of businesses. So I think there will be some there will be some tweaking around that, some relaxation of the ability to harmonize terms after a cheaper transfer. Agency workers' rights under the dreaded agency regulations. Now, you may recall that under these rights, if you take on agency workers and they're with you for 12 weeks or more, essentially you then got to give them the same terms as your permanent staff. And that has caused a lot of issues for companies that take on substantial amounts of agency staff. It stems from the agency workers' directive. It's all EU-related, I think. I don't think it'll go entirely because there'll need to be some basic protection for agency staff, but I could see it is it like to be an area uh, that is pulled back and, and pruned. Um, I think there could well be a cap introduced on discrimination awards in employment tribunal claims. Uh, as you know, uh, employment tribunal loss of earnings awards for, uh, for discrimination claims completely uncapped. That is really a potential real risk for employers. I think there will be possibly a cap put into that that will align with the cap on compensatory awards uh, that we've got for unfair dismissal uh, at the moment. So I think there'll probably be some change there. But, you know, the, the key issue, I think this, this is really the most politically interesting issue, which is still utterly unresolved at the moment, is what the EU want to, to achieve here is what's called dynamic alignment of future employment law. They basically want the EU, so the UK government, to agree that when the EU uh, legislates further laws, further protections, we will automatically replicate that going forward in UK legislation. Now, with the, the political colour and stance of this government, I just cannot see that being agreed. That is just not going to be politically acceptable. We made very clear that, you know, once once we're truly gone at the end of December, uh, we want to be completely free to make our own laws in all areas. And I just do not see the government agreeing to, to this, what the EU refer to as dynamic alignment. So I think we'll get to a place where 31st of December will be clarity as to what uh, is, is baked into our law on that date, and we've got that EU law there until it may be repealed subsequently by a UK Parliament. But to the extent to which the EU will follow new EU laws and directives uh, that will probably be generally more restrictive, more protective of workers' rights, I can't see that automatically happening. It'll be much more on a sort of pick and mix basis that the UK government decide we'll have a bit of that. We'll legislate for that. We don't want that. We won't have that. So there will not be any sort of locked in alignment going forward. But we will see some tinkering with the laws that we are faced with on the 31st of December. And I, I think my best guess, it'll be in the sort of areas that, that, that we've looked at. Some tweaking. I think it's very unlikely to be wholesale pulling back from, as I say, the embedded discrimination regime. Um, and, and some of the fundamental rights relating to that. I don't see politically that's actually acceptable. Um, so that is a really quick skip over how I see the crystal ball potentially unfolding you know, in the next few months. Uh, but who knows? As, you know, the government is at this moment locked in a room with Mr. Barnier and his notes, literally thrashing this out, and we don't know you know, where this is all going to end up. And, um, you know, we've also got the ultimate sort of potential option of the internal markets bill, which is now being threatened, under which people say we are going to be walking away, possibly from pot withdrawal. Like, so, you know, the, the temperature gauge is rising by the minute. People say it's all posturing and it's just a clever way of a little 
be all right on the night. We don't know, but um, I don't see any immediate major changes for employment law on the 31st of December, but there will be some tweaks in the areas I've, I've highlighted thereafter. Andrew, I think that's kind of crystal ball gazing there. I might need to read my palm when we're next in the office. Well, think, well delighted to have a go. The future holds for me. Thank you. Delighted to have a go. Um, um, I'm conscious that we're, we're over the, 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 the time scale here. So there's just two questions that I want to quickly kind of run through so they were kindly put forward um, before we finish up. One is the government has introduced emergency legislation for workers to carry holiday forward into the following two years due to coronavirus. Can we still insist on employees taking all their holiday within this year with the required notice? Um, I think the response to that really is why are they not able to take the annual leave? I think we've we've talked in previous webinars about um, people that are either shielding or are themselves suffering with coronavirus. Um, if they are unable to take annual leave due to health issues or because they've been shielding, then it may be that we have to allow them to kind of carry holiday forward. Carrying holiday forward would also be permissible for those that are on perhaps statutory leave um, or kind of family um, leave purposes. But employees that are um, here in the UK that don't have any um, health issues themselves, provided they are given sufficient notice, then yes, you should be able to encourage them to take their annual leave before the end of the holiday year. Just make sure they have sufficient notice and ensure that you manage that communication sensitively. Um, final question, just before we quickly wrap up. Um, if employees transfer to a new business under 2K, would the job retention scheme £1,000 bonus um, still be claimable in January if the PAYE reference number is then different because the transfer has completed between now and then? I think to quickly answer that question, I think it really depends on when the transfer takes place. If the transfer takes place prior to the end of the job retention scheme, then yes, there may well be scope for you to claim um, that bonus back. It really depends on when the transfer takes place. Um, and I think that will be key. Um, I'm conscious that we've, we've run out of time, so we can't have kind of further discussion between the group about that. But certainly, if there's kind of further questions about that or follow up on that, please contact us directly after the webinar. We can have a further chat about that. Um, I'm really sorry to have run over everybody, but thank you so much for joining us today. And we hope that kind of the topics we discussed were, were helpful. Um, we'll um, write out to each of you after the webinar for feedback. Please do feedback for, um, to us. We're obviously conscious to make this as beneficial and useful to you as possible. We're here for you to help you through this kind of difficult time. So let us know what we can do to improve the, the webinars that we're running. And um, I think that's what it me to say thank you so much to me and to Andrew. Andrew, happy birthday. I shall commence the screen as soon as everybody else leaves the conversation. Um, but thank you so much, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks, everyone.